me is Fabrice Butuel, and he's going to talk about on the dynamics of the gross pitevsk equation. Thank you very much. So first, I would like to thank the organizers, Leonid and Elena, for the kind of invitation and also the great hospitality. And so my talk will be about the gross pitevsk equation. So as it's mentioned, uh, it's basically based on, on joint works with my colleagues, uh, Raphael Danchin, Philippe Graja, Jean-Claude Sceau, and Didier Smets. I will also mention some works by André Delaire. Uh, and uh, we will look at special solutions, say, to, the, to this equation, which is uh, very close to uh, the main field of this, uh, of this conference, namely, uh, say, Ginsburg Lando energy, as well as vortices, somehow. And uh, except that I'm not going to work on bounded domains, uh, I will work on the whole of our n, n being equal to n or n equal to 2 or 3 in most cases, or 1 uh, in some parts. And uh, also the fact which is emphasized is that uh, the, the boundary condition at infinity is not equal to 0, as in, in, in several equations, but uh, the norm of psi goes to 1. So and basically this will be um, obtained uh, using finite ginsburg landau energy. So of course uh, I think... Uh, most of you here know that uh, this type of equations or problems uh, plays an important role in uh, especially in low temperature physics. And uh, this equation is in particular proposed as a model for both condensations and maybe not such a good model for superfluids and so on. But uh, it's certainly also a very important model in nonlinear optics. So many people use it in nonlinear optics. So that's a, a different motivation and uh, also might uh, raise different questions. But I will focus more on the, um, say, uh, superfluid Bose-Einstein condensation point of view in this, in this talk. And also let me mention that's uh, a sort of idealized uh, model. And if you want to go to more realistic models, uh, then you have to use some kind of convolution with a kernel, so which is uh, written here, W, on the board. And the basic gross pitayevsky equation we are looking at in the previous slide was the one where the kernel is a Dirac mass, so you don't see, uh, um, uh, you just have nearest neighbor interactions. And you model hands-only local interactions, whereas when you have a real potential W, then you have also long-range interactions, and that's a, a very different physics, which is uh, presumably not, uh, not yet really studied in the mathematical framework. So in particular, of course, I, I don't know anything about rotons, but they are physicists in the audience, so maybe I can learn from them what they are, but typically they, they seem to be connected with, uh, with such potential. And also, the kind of dynamics they, are, uh, they will yield is uh, it's certainly... Uh, a field which should be uh, investigated from the mathematical side. Uh, also, an important, uh, an important fact about this equation, this one and the previous one, it's that it's a Schrodinger equation. And uh, so the dispersive uh, properties of the equation are really uh, fundamental in the, uh, in the analysis, as we will see, and also the questions which are, which are raised. So... Uh, Maybe I should start with a preliminary act, especially for people coming from, who know a little bit about NLS, is that uh, actually our, our equation is very f close to, the, to this uh, defocusing nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is here. And usually people track more solutions which go to zero at infinity. And in this case, uh, uh, the properties of the solution are completely different. So. Uh, for this flow, usually you, 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 you expect to have nothing special. Basically, you have scattering. So you expect at least in high dimension to have scattering properties. So basically, you start with a solution, and then everything decays nicely uh, to zero. And the good model at the end will be the linear equation, which is so you neglect the, the nonlinear term. In this case, that's much richer. So in the one we, we to, which I will talk about, so not exact zero going to, to, to zero, but uh, to one, you have a much richer uh, uh, say dynamics because you have solitons so in dimension one, at least you can call them so, standing waves, vortices and so on. And so the dynamics is very rich and I think at this stage it's, it's quite um, it's not completely understood so I would even say it's far from being completely understood it's far from being understood <laughs> and um, 
uh, okay, so for, for instance, in the previous equation, you can, uh, you can do uh, some special transformations which leave the boundary conditions at infinity uh, essentially unchanged. In this setting, you cannot do this. So uh, this is one of the reasons why you, the, the, the dynamics is quite rich. And also, um, uh, what, we will, what I try to emphasize, maybe, is to, to show that uh, this equation is connected to, to a lot of uh, uh, other uh, equations which are also in, in the center of this uh, conference. Uh, basically, uh, on one side, you have the incompressible Euler equation with vortices and so on, as we already seen, have seen. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will more insist on the compressible case, which is the closest model which, uh, which comes from the equation and which raised presumably uh, questions which are, which are as difficult as, um, as the gross pitayevsky equation, but with some differences. Uh, of course, once you know that the compressible Euler equation is at stake, then uh, you might guess that the linear wave equation might also appear in the computation. And as a matter of fact, there's a whole variety of equations which can be deduced from the compressible Euler equation, which have a KDV equation, and the KP, Kadamchev Petachvili equation, which are related to this, uh, to this modeling, and so they also come up as some limits uh, uh, in the hydrodynamical formulation of the equation. So once you have this connection with Euler, then you, you, you're in the realm of, um, of say, uh, uh, fluid dynamics, and you solve this, uh, this fact. So the, the important fact, which is certainly uh, something which is crucial, and which is somehow orthogonal to the vortex situation, it's when you can uh, uh, use the hydrodynamical formulation of the equation, which comes now here. So if you want to uh, write the hydrodynamical formulation, and that's really a, a point which is, uh, which is crucial in the, in the whole uh, discussion, and uh, unfortunately also in the whole theory, so if you want to go further, somehow you have to understand the case of vortices, is that if you, uh, of course, it's a simple remark. If you don't know, if you know that the solution does not vanish, then you, you may write using what people call the Madelung transformation, which is uh, completely, say, obvious. So you, you, you single out the modulus, and here people use, in general, the square root of the modulus because it's simpler for the equations, and the phase, and I think we saw it in many talks. And uh, now instead of looking at, uh, at phi, you're looking at the gradient of phi, and you call it V, if you prefer, you might put an arrow on the V since it's a vector. It's a vector field on, um, on our N. Then, uh, not on our N, it's a two-dimensional two, two vector on our N. Then you get this, um, this nice equation, which is uh, called the hydrodynamical form of, uh, of gross pitadetsky And so what is, uh, what is relevant what is relevant here, if you forget about this term, so I think it's in the next slide, but I can already say here, if you, if you remove this term, then you have exactly the compressible Euler equation uh, with pressure law uh, P, so the pressure equal to rho squared. Of course, all, all what I'm saying in here, it's only possible if you don't have any vortex. If you have a vortex, then this way to write the equation f breaks down and, uh, um, and there's no, uh, no way to, to, to circumvent the thing. So that, that's a fact. So the term which uh, I removed in the last slide is this one. So uh, somehow it's a gradient of, of course it's a little bit difficult to understand, but this is really, uh, so it's a Laplacian of rho. So rho is a sort of density of a fluid, of a rho. And, take a, and this is what people call the uh, quantum pressure. So if you remove this term, which is a third order term, then you really get the uh, compressible Euler equation. So you might expect that uh, some effects of the equation should be very close to, to the one which uh, are uh, given by the, uh, this equation. And of course, it's the Euler equation with a, a very precious, uh, precise pressure law, namely P of the density rho equal to rho squared. So rho is equal to the, the, the modulus of the, uh, of the square root of the modulus of the, uh, of the phase uh, of, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, <coughs> the wave function is exactly a density. And so that's the way we have to understand it. And of course, this whole description is only meaningful as long as rho does not vanish. But this is also very connected to what uh, people usually do in compressible Euler equations. So this equation, maybe there's some rho which is 
uh, has a meaning only when rho does not vanish, which you see here. And when rho vanish, then people call it cavitation or whatever. And that's a very difficult problem. So I, I'm not an expert, but they're certainly here in this field, uh, in this room. But uh, anyhow, what is known is that rho comes to zero when it's a very difficult topic. And I don't think there are so many results uh, uh, in this case. So it's exactly the same. So when rho is going to zero, you, you are, you, you're in trouble. Uh, okay, so why, uh, so the remark, why, so that's maybe a slightly uh, uh, different point of view. It's that um, the vortices, in some sense, are also similar to singularities in focusing equations. So that's, uh, uh, but uh, maybe it's not clear to, 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 to show it here. Uh, of course, you, you might say that the hydrodynamical formulation, uh, you, you might use it also for standard cubic uh, NLS, but on the other hand, if you impose a boundary condition going to zero at infinity, then uh, uh, this fact that you expect that you have not so many points where, where it vanishes, it's somehow uh, a little bit uh, uh, unrealistic. So now, uh, on one hand, so you, you try to, to to stress the connections with the Euler equation, but on the other hand, you have a good point: is that this is a gross, p this is a nonlinear Schrödinger equation. So, as a nonlinear Schrödinger equation, you expect to have a certain numbers of uh, of quantities to be conserved, and uh, as expected, uh, the first one is a gross Vitayevsky equation, which is written on the board, and I think we. Um, we, we saw it many, many times in the, in the conference. So this is the standard one with phi going to, to C or R2. So phi is complex valued. And uh, as I mentioned, it's not uh, on the bounded domain, but on the whole of Rn, so here. And in particular, the fact that this energy, as we will see, is bounded, imposes a sort of boundary condition at infinity that the norm of psi has to go to zero, uh, at, uh, to one, sorry, has to go to one uh, at infinity. Another quantity which is also very uh, relevant and important in the, um, in the uh, Schrodinger equation is the momentum. Basically, in Schrodinger equation, you remove this minus one, but uh, somehow this is to make the thing appear to be likely. Also, this does not yield a, a definition either. Uh, so somehow you, ha you have to, to, to make a renormalization to, uh, because if you just make gradient psi psi, then you're in trouble because you don't know that this quantity is bounded. So that's one of the technical problems in this, uh, in this equation, but uh, more or less this can be in, uh, overcome. And the last, uh, and the last uh, quantity which is conserved is the mass. Of course, all these conservations are more or less formal, but uh, in some sense you can make rigorous statements. Uh, up to now, I must say that uh, most people have used energy and momentum, the mass, which in some sense should be conserved, has not played such an important role. And uh, this conservation law, they work also for more general gross Pitayevsky, which I just vaguely will uh, talk about. Uh, there's a first observation, it's that uh, if you are able to use the Mandelung transformation, so in the absence of, um, of vortices, so when you if you can write this, of course, you, you, we have seen this in many places that in presence of vortices, uh, this is impossible, but assume you, you, you have no vortex and you can write it in this form, then the momentum has a very simple form. And then, uh, in, if you're in this case, this is really bounded by the ginsburg landau energy. And the mass has an even, even simpler form, so it's just uh, more or less, so you, you, lo looking for, you expect the density to be close to one in the whole domain, and it's a sort of fluctuation around the mean value, which is at infinity is one. So rho is going to one, and of course, there's no reason that the mass is finite if you just don't impose it uh, at the beginning, but uh, it's more or less expected that uh, uh, you might describe nice uh, conservation law. So as I told before, so the fact that uh, the boundary condition comes from finite energy solutions. So at the end of the talk, maybe I will speak about infinite energy solutions, but the idea is not, uh, not too far. So we're really interested in solution where uh, we have some bound on this potential. And once you have this bound on this potential, this uh, somehow uh, gives you a, at least a formal, uh, a formal way to, uh, to characterize a boundary condition at infinity. So if, if the potential is bounded, then uh, at least in some mean value term, since you, you should have this, uh, 
this quantity going to one. And uh, perhaps this, uh, this slide, you already seen it uh, too many times, so maybe I should uh, skip a little bit, but it's just to say that, of course, uh, an important difference with uh, other issues is that the infimum of uh, ginsburg landau potential is achieved on the circle, so the whole var variety of um, degrees of freedom, which is, a, which is a phase, so the phase somehow gives you something turning here around. And uh, this is, so if you just go the real part, then you have the Allen Kahn equation, and in some place you will see this, uh, this, 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 um, this uh, play a, a special role also. Okay, so what are the special solutions? So, uh, uh, which are the, the states which play an important role in the, in the dynamics? So you have many, of course, the first state, it's the vacuum state, so the, the state with the infimum energy. And of course, it's not zero because we are in Ginsburg-Landau, so it's, uh, it's something of norm one. So as I said before, it's a whole, uh, whole circle of, of minimizers, which minimize the potential. And uh, then you have the vortices we, we have seen many times. I will keep my sense of vortex, but it's not much different from Leonid's one or uh, Leah's one. I think it's even the same. Uh, and also thrumming waves, which I will mention uh, later on. And vortices, maybe it's not uh, uh, perhaps uh, necessary to spend too much time. Uh, I think Leah already explained this degree D vortex. So this is one which I consider here the one with radial symmetry. And once you, uh, you so one, of course, one important observation, which presumably was made before, uh, also, here it's more important, it's that uh, we work on an infinite domain. So not only you have a high energy close to the core, if you have an epsilon, I should mention, I have, in my talk, epsilon is equal to one, and uh, eventually, if I have an epsilon, it's a different one from one, the one people use, so, but I'm not sure I, I'm using my epsilon here uh, in the talk. So anyhow, epsilon, uh, in the sense of a previous tool, is equal to one, but with this kind of function, you have also energy divergence of infinity. However, if you somehow glue together different vortices, then you're able to have some, uh, so d different vortices, then you, you, this may be not a good choice of a number, say L vortices, then you, uh, you have finite energy provided the total mass is, um, is zero. And uh, I should mention that, uh, uh, that uh, this configuration that have been studied a lot by, um, by several people, so maybe uh, uh, I didn't quote. Uh, so I think the first paper was by Colliander and Gerard, but I forgot to mention also papers by Lynn and then David and many people. So it's a whole, uh, it's a whole story which uh, I'm not going to, to go into here. I, I will have a different point of view, which is, uh, uh, but which is somehow connected to, to, to what is done here. It's to look what happens to simple and single solutions. And so this is a graph, but I think, uh, here again, uh, you all know this uh, already for, and uh, so uh, this is a picture uh, which is more or less what, uh, what was explained in the previous slides. If you glue together uh, a solution with a, so this is a plus one, this, so of course depends how you rent things and how you see your, your board, but this, uh, this you, can, my, you might imagine that that's a plus one and that's a minus one, so uh, if my picture is correct, they rotate in, in different, uh, directions, and if you take this as an initial data, then it's known that uh, they travel in one direction. And uh, this is also called in fluid dynamics the, the Helmut solution, or, uh, or Kelvin solution, or I think it's more of a Kelvin solution. And, um, and it turns out that this can also uh, yield a, a, stationary, uh, a stationary wave. But this is exactly like uh, the two if you're using uh, the, the point vortex equation as explained by um, uh, Evelyn uh, two days ago, you know, yesterday, uh, then you find exactly this motion. So you take the point vortex equation and you, you, you show this. So I will f what I will show is that you have a solution of this form which are solitary waves. So uh, let me first say what I'm, I'm calling a solitary wave. It's basically a solution which uh, has a constant profile and a constant speed along one direction, but of course, since uh, you have invariance by rotation, you may choose, say, the, 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 uh, the direction around, uh, along the, the x-axis, x1 axis, 
And uh, then, more or less, you, you translate this pro profile with speed c. So, and then c becomes a number, and you can, of course, choosing the right orientation, you can assume that it's, uh, that it's positive. And so the first, uh, the first thing, which is uh, certainly very old, is that in dimension one, in dimension one, which of course excludes vortices and so on, you have an explicit solution which is corresponds solving an ODE. So when you plug this solution inside the uh, equation, you get a nice ODE and uh, you try to integrate this. It's not so completely obvious, but it's not so, so difficult either. And then you, you find this solution. So what you see is that uh, uh, the, uh, you have an imaginary part which is constant, C over square root of two. And here you have something which uh, for the experts looking like the king solution, uh, so uh, something joining minus one to plus one, and when c is equal to zero, the solution is scalar. It's a scalar solution, so it's basically uh, uh, wh uh, what I call the king solution. It's something uh, I'm not sure that it, it was mentioned before, but it's something which which doing this. So here you have minus one plus one. So here's uh, x, and uh, of course you. you you're not touching uh, plus one, and it's exactly going by this, um, this thing. But the important thing also is that the speed is constrained by square root of two. And uh, square root of two is exactly the speed of, uh, of sound when you refer to this other equation. So you have a wave equation uh, embedded in this, uh, in this whole framework. So the speeds of this solitary, oh, sorry, the speeds of this solitary waves um, uh, have to be less than square root of two, and of course, when c equals zero, you have a standing wave. So the King solution, which is here on the board, is a standing wave; it doesn't uh, move. And uh, as a matter of fact, so th this is a solitary wave in dimension one, but people call it also a soliton because it's an integrable system. So it's not only uh, a solitary wave, but have much, uh, uh, much stronger, uh, stronger information, which. Uh, uh, which allows you to, to understand the dy dynamics of the uh, equation. So uh, when you're looking at, uh, an maybe you can, uh, an important picture in this field is to look at the graph here. So the graph you, you, you should plug in is here the energy and here the momentum. So that, these are really the quantities which, uh, which play an important role as in standard, uh, as in standard um, Schrodinger equation. And so when you plug the solution here on this graph and you see that, uh, of course, the precise numbers maybe are not so, so important, so pi over two, so that's, uh, that's just from the computation. Uh, uh, and here, of course, you have to, to go to zero, so maybe just the picture is not uh, accurate enough. Uh, when you pick a point here, then if you take the slope of the, uh, of the solution, then you get the speed. So somehow the speed is a sort of uh, Lagrange multiplier when uh, you represent the, this, uh, this solution. The speed is always less than, uh, than uh, square root of two. <laughs> and uh, the second observation is that uh, all solution minimize the energy when you fix the momentum. So you fix momentum and you take the, uh, you take the smallest configuration possible, so the one which minimizes the energy, and then you get the soliton corresponding to the speed. And then, of course, the soliton is defined with the speed with the, with, the, with the speed, the speed is exactly the slope of, uh, of a curve. So that's, uh, and so this is actually standard, and that's uh, an, an observation which is, um, which is uh, important to obtain orbital stability. I will, I will come to this, uh, to this uh, discussion later, uh, which was first uh, proved by uh, Zi Wu Lin, so it's not Fang Wu Lin, uh, and later we, we give, give a different proof with uh, um, Gravjean and Jean-Claude Sceau, and also there's a different approach by, um, say, uh, integrable system by Gerard and Wang, uh, where you can prove that this, um, the solutions are orbitally stable, so whatever it means at this stage, I will, I will come to this later, as I said. And also an important fact is that you have no scattering theory. So scattering theory, as I told you before, is that you, when you start from an equation and uh, you're looking for a linear equation which uh, somehow uh, explains the dispersion. So here you have dispersion, but the dispersion is not uh, described by, um, by a linear theory. And also, 
So this is maybe a surprise, but uh, the, the waves are, are really related to the solitons of KDV. So, of course, at this stage, maybe it's just looking li li like a stroke uh, of chance. But the, the equations are deeply connected, KDV and Gross-Vitayevsky, uh, in one dimension, of course. So, uh, of course, uh, KDV, uh, the solutions are scalar. So what you're looking at is only the, not the, um, not the total solution. You, you just pre-normalize somehow the, uh, the modulus. So you, you take the modulus, one minus the modulus, and you do the suitable renormalizations, which are a little bit complicated. And at the end, uh, it turns out that the solitons are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the solitons of KDV, but here you might say, of course, whatever you do in one dimension, you always turn out to, to, to get this kind of a strange solution. But the connection is really also on the evolution. Uh, and so somehow you have a, a correspondence between solitons of KDV and solitons of, um, of uh, gross pitayevsky So you can somehow explain. Maybe uh, still there's some work to be done, but uh, I think I won't have time to... Uh, presumably to, to go into the details of that, but uh, let me mention that from the physics, this was first, uh, uh, was first uh, proved by Shabbat in the 70s, so there was some formal explanation about the link between the two, but uh, to have really rigorous mathematical proof, I guess we need some time. So there are some, uh, some theorems about the connections between the two equations, but no, uh, say, no real correspondence at the level of uh, the integrable system, which uh, requires some uh, some uh, high expertise, which uh, at least. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's the first order. So when you, you when you expand the, um, the equation, you 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 end up with KDV at this order, and the third somehow the you see the third the third order term. Oh, sorry. The third order term here uh, is more or less something which. Uh, comes from the quantum pressure, so this third order term. So th this is the, the way uh, it ends up. So otherwise, uh, perhaps you have the first approximation, which would be a Burgers equation, and but uh, KDV then is uh, is better, and also doesn't yield the explosion and, and so on. And it's integrable. So, but you can also do something formal on the level of uh, integrable systems, and eventually you end up with uh, with a theorem, which does not yet exist, but uh, which is likely. So. Uh, and so th this was the King solution, but uh, uh <coughs> okay. So now, now I turn in higher dimension. So uh, of course, in higher dimension, um, you, you cannot integrate the equation by just a few tricks, and then you you need to uh, to to be uh, to use other methods. But as I told you before, you have also um, you have also a characterization of. Uh, uh, of solitary waves as by variational method. So the method is to, to minimize the energy as before, uh, taking the, the, the momentum constant, and then you get essentially a picture which is close to the one you have in dimension one. Uh, it's here. It's here, so you see, so this is a curve of, uh, of uh, so in, uh, now we meet a little bit better zero, but uh, it should be the same in the previous one, but. Uh, the slope. So this is a curve of solution, and so you can prove that uh, you can prove that uh, to each point on this curve corresponds uh, a solution, a real solution. So you can go, you can prove that the minimization process is a solution. So it's more or less uh, a refined version of concentration compactness, and uh, so that was uh, something we we did with um, Gravja and Jean Claude Sou, uh, already some time ago. And more recently, so maybe uh, 2011, but I think it's going to be published, the, uh, Chiron and Maris were able to prove that, thanks to this method, that you have also orbital stability of a solution, yeah, also whatever it means. So, uh, uh, and an interesting fact is that, uh, which we already proved before with uh, Jean-Claude, is that when you go to the high energy, so you see this is an increasing slope, and when you're here, uh, then uh, for the solution they exhibit vortices. So in the, doing this procedure, you don't need to use the Madelung transformation. You don't see it. And when you're here, uh, you have the pairs of vortices I described before, so plus and minus one going to, uh, to one direction. On the other hand, when you go to this curve, so when you're going to the, to the, to the slow part, so the low energy part of a the curve, then you find the KP soliton. So somehow this is a... This is a KP, it's a, which uh, I don't think I have written KP. Did I? No, didn't I? 
maybe I, I read in different uh, slides, so it's a little bit far. It's a KP, it's a two-dimensional version of, uh, of KDV. So you, KDV is one-dimensional, and KP, you need to add some transversal uh, modification. And when you do the computation, then you, you exactly end up with a KP solid term. So this, this part of the curve is quite well understood by the KP theory, and the, the part which is here is well understood uh, by solid terms. So I come back to the first to the high speed uh, energy. So the solid terms basically you, uh, which I take are here. So you see you have a plus one, so you, you have to, to take the same pictures. So this one rotates in one sense, this one in the other. The distance between the two is two over C, basically. And the energy diverges like two pi log of C, but C goes to zero in this. Uh, so the, the vortices in this, uh, in this formalism, uh, they have a small speed, high energy, and very high momentum. So that's a, that's a game. And uh, I said it's Kelvin solid term, so when you're going from through, uh, fluid dynamics. So the other part of the curve, it's also very, uh, uh, perhaps even more interesting because uh, uh, it's a different way to see the KP equation. So here you have uh, the slope, so you never, you're always below the slope square root of P. And now I'm focusing on this part, so small energy and small momentum. And it follows that the speed is going to square root of two. So this solid term somehow, scrubbing waves, we have a speed which is close to square root of two. And uh, we have a very small energy. And, uh, <coughs> and what turns out is that you, uh, you, when you do the, the same kind of renormalization, so introduce some epsilon, so now the epsilon here is the discrepancy between two, so uh, I'll say square root of two, and the actual speed. So when you introduce this parameter in, in the computation, you do this expansion, then you, uh, you turn out to this, uh, to, this, uh, to this equation, so which is the KP equation. So the f first thing is that, uh, so D1 means along the x axis, uh, x, uh, y, uh, this is along the x, y axis. And I look at this equation, this is exactly K, KDV, yes, almost, so it depends on the constant. And here you have a transversal perturbation, which uh, embodies the fact that you are in two dimension. And let me also mention that this, um, uh, put it, didn't put it on the slide, uh, since it's not the main focus here, but uh, uh, the formal computation have already been done by physicists, uh, mainly Roberts and Grant and his group uh, a long time ago. And so what we provided was a, a rigorous mathematical proof of this, uh, of this fact. So uh, another interesting question is that we know that, the, um, that there are special solutions to KP equation, which are called the LAM solution. So the form maybe at this stage is not so relevant, but uh, uh, you, can, you can provide the form by uh, inverse scattering. So it's, it's really something uh, uh, also KP raises some, some, some real difficulties in uh, from a PDE point of view, you can, you can find the LAMP solution. It's not known that this is a ground state for, uh, for KP. And, um, but so the, so the KP energy is given here, so it's a sort of complicated. So it gives you a gradient in the x1 direction, but here you take the derivative along the y direction, but with a delta minus one, and here also whatever it means. So it, it, it requires that some averages have to be zero. So you, you can understand this in Fourier transformation, but it requires some strong conditions, but uh, and then of course you have a, a standard cubic term here. And, uh, and okay, so that's, um, that's a fact that we don't know. So what, one of the important questions in this field, so said differently, is do we know that the soliton is unique or not? So that's really an important question in higher dimension, which uh, at least as I know, is completely open. In one dimension, usually you know because you integrate and you have a special form. In higher dimension, just find them by some uh, indirect arguments, which are calculus operation essentially. And then uh, you never know if it's unique or not. And unique is very important when you turn to the stability issue uh, because uh, then you, you should change a little bit the term what is orbital stability and so on. So, of course, it's a this issue is pre presumably an issue just in elliptic PDEs, but uh, at this stage, uh, uh, it's, completely, it's completely open. It's even open for KP, which is perhaps a little simpler, but uh, there's strong evidence that this is a ground state and it's unique, but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not proven yet. So now I turn finally to, uh, 
to the uh, to the uh, to the solitary rest in three dimension, and here the picture is very different. Also, uh, my representation is maybe not so uh, so clear. So what happens is, is that so th th this part of the curve should not be there. So this should be different color. So you can do the same thing as before, namely you can minimize the round constraint, and you find this curve, and then in this region somehow you stop. Somehow you stop, and the solution completely breaks down. So that means that uh, the solitary waves exist up to some amount, momentum P0, which is here, and so the minimizing solitary waves, they do not exist below. And in this region, it's free from uh, solitary waves. And uh, as a matter of fact, th there's a theory of low scattering, uh, low energy scattering, which was um, produced by Gustafsson, Niki, Nakanishi, and Sai. And so you have scattering in this region, so you can prove it. So perhaps it's not with this pH zero, but in a region close to zero, you can prove that if you have small energy, then you have real scattering with, uh, uh, with a corresponding uh, equation. So uh, on the other hand, uh, <coughs> the, on the other hand, this branch of solution, it continues somehow, and then you have an upper branch here, which is represented here. In, in blue also, and this is not minimizing, but this branch of solution, which was conjectured also by the physicists, the same ones who did the two-dimensional work, they happened to, uh, to, uh, to exist, and that's the work of Maris, and more recently, uh, I forgot to, to, to mention it, uh, there works also by Maris and Chiron about this, so you can prove that this, uh, this branch really does exist, and possibly to study its, uh, its properties. So I think they, they did this also and proved that, um, that uh, uh, this works. So, so the next issue I would like to, uh, to discuss is the, uh, the stability issue. And uh, in order to, to deal with stability issues, then you, you see as, as uh, up to the slides so of the main result I proved here when you're looking at solitary waves and so on, what you're doing is essentially elliptic equation, stationary equation, all for you. You have a movement, but uh, you don't really need to enter into the dynamics of the equation. But once you, uh, you want to address the stability issue of the solutions you have found, then you need to know something about the dynamics. And uh, the first thing to do, of course, is to, uh, to study the Cauchy problem. So in which sense do we, do we have, uh, no. in which sense do we have solutions to the Cauchy problem? And uh, let me say that um, uh, now theory is very well developed for this, uh, for this question. So say basically the first work uh, was presumably work with Jean from Jean-Claude and myself in 99. We first started to study solitary waves. And uh, that's a simple observation that you can always find solution in this space. So you, you, you perturb one, so constant at infinity, times an H1 term then uh, you somehow make the ansatz and then you, you make the expansion and then you prove that this is a standard, uh, more or less standard Schrodinger equation and then you have a nice theory to prove that you have global existence. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a better theory which has been developed later by, uh, in particular by Patrick Gérard, Clément Gallo, uh, for this range of, um, of uh, dimensions, but also for dimension four, so also it's presumably less relevant for physics by Kilip, Popovniku and Bissan, uh, which is simply the, the energy space where the energy is, is bounded. So really the, 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 the best space you can imagine when you want to turn to these questions, in particular when you, you want to, to, to deal with preservation of energy and momentum. And of course our original space, it's part of the space, but converse is not true. Uh, as, uh, presumably it's easy to see. And you can, uh, you this, uh, this uh, Cauchy problem theory carries over to some extent. I have to be uh, a little cautious. It depends to, to several properties of a potential W, uh, and most of them are relevant from the physical point of view, at least from a physical example, and it works up to dimension three. And all the solutions conserve the energy, which is uh, the least you might expect. And so what are, are the main uh, questions, at least when you... Uh, when you deal with problem waves and special solutions, special profiles, and so on. So the first question is, uh, the first uh, um, question is uh, the, uh, the, how to say, the, uh, the stability issue. 
And that, that is a rather standard issue when you're do, going to, to Schrodinger equation or dispersive equation. It's, uh, if you perturb a little bit one of your solutions, do you stay close to, uh, as time to infinity, to, to the same traveling wave? So somehow you modify a little bit the traveling wave, but are you staying close or not to your original profile? And as I will uh, mention uh, in a moment, there are two kinds of notions. So I will a little bit clarify the, the, the orbital stability, which is uh, essentially one which, which is built up on tools from calculus of aeration. And um, the second one, which is more demanding, it's the asymptotic stability, which in turn is based on uh, dispersive properties of the equation. So the, the second one, it's much more difficult to obtain. And uh, there are not so many examples that at least where, where you can get uh, asymptotic stability. The second question, which is at least uh, uh, as important as the first one, is perhaps it's a more philosophical question uh, also in direction to, to physics. It's, uh, it's uh, of course, we, we saw these nice vortices and so on. We have a nice structure and so on. But the question is, uh, why do we observe vortices? So, that's, uh, so somehow nature creates vortices in fluids and so on, but uh, it's a complicated structure. So of course you can construct it from a mathematical point of view, but somehow you expect that it grows out of, say, very simple solution, and that's something which is expected by the, uh, by the physicist. Uh, in particular, uh, if I don't have time to, to go to this, one thing you expect is that we, uh, you remember in this branch of solution which is here, you expect that this branch of solution is unstable, and the instability of this branch will create uh, vortices, uh, these strings of vortices. And there, I think there's some numerics in this sense, but... Uh, uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so once you have vorticities, then you have to, to understand how it will interact with the waves, the various waves you have seen before. And in particular, so somehow you have a nice description of, uh, say, the equation in terms of Euler and so on, equation without vortices, but how can you bring the two together to, to provide a uniform framework? And uh, in Ginsburg-Landau, you can do it for several equations, in particular the, the heat equation. So when you look at the heat equation, you can understand how waves and, uh, and vorticity interact. But uh, for the Schrödinger equation, the speech is quite, uh, uh, it's quite uh, uh, difficult. So, <clears throat> so what, what means orbital stability? I'm not sure my picture is very... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> eliminating the, the question, but basically what you expect is that first, the first observation is that you have a, a manifold of solitons, so basically, uh, so here let me look at the one-dimensional case, then you have a curve of solitons, but uh, maybe I didn't mention it, but also you can rotate the thing, so you have a, at least uh, one to three-dimensional manifold of solitons. One translation, then the other one is uh, the speed, and the third one is a phase. So you have three, three, three dimension manifold. And so usually it's, it's finite dimensional. And so when you perturb it a little bit, so what you expect is that you have this manifold, and my, my picture may be not so, 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 so well drawn, it's that you stay close to the manifold in some sense. Uh, you have no, no way to, uh, to escape from the neighborhood of the manifold. And that's, uh, you stay close and that's, uh, that's what you expect. And of course, if you're in finite dimensions and you have a system like this one, which is Hamiltonian, so I didn't mention at the beginning, but once you have a Hamiltonian system, that's the best you can expect because you're never going to meet the manifold since you have several conserved quantities. Think of integrable systems. So uh, that's the best you can expect. On the other hand, uh, so I'm not sure the, the, the picture is much more uh, uh, <laughs> illuminating the the question, but uh, asymptotic stability means that when you perturb it a little bit, so, uh, so this, uh, I try to, to, to start from initial datum, which is, um, which is far, and somehow you're going close to the manifold, so you, you approach the manifold. So like somehow you will do in a dissipative system. Of course, when you will say that this is nonsense, since uh, in, uh, in, all, in all this question, you might reverse time, and then starting from here, you can go here, and then you lost. But uh, of course, you have to take more subtle norms. You're not going to, 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 to take, uh, say, norms which uh, are consistent with conservation of energy. So somehow, you, you're going to, to, to play with local norms. So you have a convergence, but in very local sense. And that's really where dispersion comes uh, 
comes into play. So that's really uh, uh, the game, and that's really uh, somehow has to, you have to understand really the dynamics of, of the equation and the, and the uh, <coughs> okay, so that, that's the result you get um, in 1D, so I just state the results in 1D, and that's uh, a theorem that you can prove, so as I said, first by Ziwulin, and later we have a different approach with uh, Graf Jasso and, and Didier Smet. Uh, so, so of course, here, here's the distance. So you, you take an initial datum with, uh, with this distance. So you have, you're close to one of the, uh, of the solitons, you see. I suppose that, that you're close to one of the soliton. Then the theorem tells you uh, that you, uh, you stay close to the manifold of solution when, uh, when time flows. Of course, here you see uh, uh, the distance has to be understood in the distance to the manifold, not to, uh, to a single soliton. So you have to, to take the infimum among all uh, A, theta, and C also, so C is missing. Uh, but uh, you, you can put C also off of this. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and here, sorry, I will maybe not uh, use it, but if you want to prove such a statement, uh, basically what you say is that you have two quantities which are conserved, energy and momentum, and this along uh, imposes this condition. So you once you're so constrained and you have some Hessian form which is positive, and you cannot go too far from your initial state. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, asymptotic, um, uh, so orbital, sorry. Now I turn to, uh, to orbital stability, and here the theorem is quite, uh, it's quite different, uh, you see. So the ansatz is still the same, so you're close to, uh, to one of the solitons with a restriction that I'm not uh, able to, to consider uh, the standing wave. And uh, what I say is that I will converge to some other soliton. So of course not necessarily the same, so that's a, the reason it's quite obvious since you're on the curve of solitons, if you move a little bit on the curve, then you change your soliton. So, so uh, nearby soliton is itself a, uh, a perturbation of the original soliton. So you have to pick up, sorry, you have to pick up um, a different soliton. So this is the C star. So you, you pick up a different soliton, and then you have a phase freedom. So you somehow you embed it in this term. And here you have tra the translation freedom. And when you do this, you say that you have convergence to this soliton, but in a local norm. So let's say uh, uh, on some interval uh, minus r, r, whatever r is. And uh, the second thing is that, uh, so this A of T is a translation of your soliton, and when you um, take its derivative, somehow the speed of a soliton, it converges also to the speed of, um, it converges also to the speed of your, 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 your limiting object. And also at the end you can prove that this uh, phase shift also goes to zero, so it's not turning around or, or, uh, away, but, uh, <coughs> But uh, at some point, it, uh, you, you will converge to some, maybe not converge, but uh, it's going slower and slower. And uh, as I said before, it's really based on some dispersive properties of the equation. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, it's really uh, related to earlier, so the strategy is the same as uh, an earlier work of Martel and Verme, who proved uh, uh, asymptotic stability of a KDV soliton. And that's a very famous work on this. And there are not so many uh, equations which are asymptotically stable. For instance, uh, uh, you, you might think, okay, that's a general property of dispersive equation. So it's not. So it's not. You can take, uh, if you take the, the cubic equation, let's say EUT oxi, since I put it with oxi, Laplace oxi, equal, uh, say, so the, and presumably I have to put the minus here. So that's the focusing uh, cubic uh, equation. Then you have solitons. You have solitons as well as here, or standing waves. But if you perturb it with a, uh, with a smaller soliton, what they happen, they have to have periodic uh, movement, so which is really something which is not so, uh, so you have the, the big one, the small one, and then they, they do this. So you. And what you expect, actually, naively, you expect that you take a big one, you have a small one, then the small one goes, takes, the big one takes a little of the energy of a, of a small one, as usual in life, and the rest goes to, <laughs> goes to infinity. And then you have a, maybe a bigger soliton, and the small one has disappeared. And that's not what's happening. So the small, the small one survives, so which is good news. <laughs> 
So, uh, and uh, there are not so many, so wh that's what people call a breather because they somehow breathe and you have a more famous breather as maybe in uh, Shin Gordon equation and, and you can compute the equation so it's everything, it's uh, integrable so you really know what's happening. It's a difficult question to know which equation uh, make uh, briefers appear or not. So that's, uh, I think, quite an uh, open question. And I think there are not so many, uh, there are not so many rigorous works about uh, higher dimensions. So what is asymptotically stable, what is not? There are, there's a huge literature, but usually we have some conditions which are not so extremely simple to prove, and at least not for the simplest models. So uh, I think the cubic equation in 2D is open to know if it's uh, stable or, or not. And so that's, um, that's the thing. So maybe I'm closing to, I don't know, five minutes. Oh, it's too much. <laughs> so I will, give some, uh, I will give some ideas about the proofs uh, without going to the details. Uh, the strategy really is, um, uh, is close to, uh, to, as I said, uh, to the um, KDV equation, but KDV equation has a and foresight has some different uh, uh, properties which uh, happen to be, mm, to be quite different from Schrodinger. KDV, you have, uh, it's not com completely reversible. So you have one sense, so the dispersion goes in one sense and the soliton in the other one. Whereas here you have a Schrodinger equation, so you expect things to be a little bit more complicated. It turns out that uh, finally you can implement the same argument to, to yield the, the uh, the, 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 the proof. So the proof really is, again, so uh, the proof, it looks really, it's not so different from orbits of stability, but as I told you before, it uses um, dispersive properties. So what you use, it's not now global integrals like here, but you really use the conservation of a momentum. So recall that this is the momentum, this is the, the energy. So since you might think that eta is small here, so you, here you just have the gradient, and here you have something, so here it's a standard KDV term, and uh, sorry, standard Ginfoglanda term, which happens to be quadratic in this uh, setting, and this term is a sort of perturbation which is not so, so, so relevant, but when you're looking at the momentum, then you have a conservation law which is here, and it turns out that uh, terms have a sign. So when you're looking at uh, the first one, so the sort of conservation law, this one is positive provided eta is, uh, you, you just compute what you, uh, you think, so he, this one is simple. Uh, here eta should not be too, too strong, so this is a coercive term, and this one also has, a, has also a sign. And this is really useful when you turn to the, uh, to, the to, to, to do the thing. And then, um, so that's, that's a key observation, so the conservation law, and then the second observation is what people in the field uh, of, <coughs> of this uh, dispersive equation or even uh, parabolic equation, you can use it, is uh, called uh, a modulation. It's basically, you have to choose a decomposition on your manifold, so it's a sort of projection on your manifold which is suitable for the equation. So once you, so maybe it's becoming a little bit technical, but you, uh, once you have something, uh, a solution which is near a soliton, then you always can, can find a soliton which is nearby, and here t, t is maybe not so important, plus a rest term, and for the rest term, you might impose a certain number of orthogonality condition, which uh, in your proofs uh, uh, will turn some terms to be, to be equal to zero. So there's not a way to, to do this. And uh, once you have done this, uh, you go to, uh, to conservation law. So you recall you have a local conservation law here, and then you, you have just to find the, the appropriate test function so that this conservation law tells you uh, something about the equation. So it's a sort of viral theorem. So if, for people who are, aware, uh, who are familiar with um, Schrodinger, and uh, so okay, so you somehow you, you, you start from, uh, so the test function here, it has this form, so the, the, the actual form is important, but uh, uh, you have this form, so when you integrate this against this function, so you have R, you translate phi, you, you're looking at some, uh, so R is an arbitrary number, and then somehow you're looking at the energy, uh, at the momentum, which is on one side of the, um, of the soliton. And uh, what it does take is a sort of monotonity CT formula, which is written here. And the good news here is that you find that this term is positive. So when you integrate, you have a 
you have some information of the positive quantities and working with uh, again when you uh, you eventually f I will maybe stop here because that's too uh, it's starting to be too complicated but that, that's uh, the main thing it's uh, that you have this monotonicity formula and that's exactly the same trick or it's, of course it inspired our our argument which is used in Martel and Merrill so, so it's a strong so the analogy uh, between KDV and uh, gross Pitalis is actually very strong so you can uh, uh, so the methods which were able to work in KDV, they transpose, also you have this uh, different dispersion relations, they transpose to the, to the gross pitayevsky case. So, of course, so maybe I just, uh, sorry, uh, uh, okay, I just raised maybe the, the most important question. Uh, of course, we, are, we have, so basically what, what, we, uh, what we did in the one-dimensional case, it's essentially what we would like to do in the two-dimensional case, and which is the main topic, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the conferences to, to prove that you have also asymptotic stability of uh, vortex solution. So uh, the vortex, I t said it before, has infinite energy, but uh, you can cook out a good, uh, a good Cauchy problem. So you, you, you don't worry about that. And then the issue is to say, uh, do I perturb, if I perturb a vortex by something, at the end, do I see again a vortex? So, so I, the nice vortex and all the perturbations have been uh, have been scattered at infinity. So, which is quite likely, but uh, uh, it's of course not uh, not simple to 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 address. And of course, wh one other problem is that um, the modulation part is maybe more easy because you have just one vortex up to translation. You don't have a family of vortices. But on the other hand, you cannot implement the hydrodynamical uh, uh, formulation, uh, in particular because uh, in two dimensions, you don't have an infinity bound. So when you're in one dimension, once you are far from, say, zero, then you stay far from zero by uh, Sobolev embedding, and that's no, no longer the case in higher dimensions. No, so I stay here, so I'm not <laughs> going to generation of what is it? Any questions or comments?